everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. So about a week ago I released my character examination of Egwene Alvir. Now Egwene is a polarizing character within the Wheel of Time and expectedly the comments on the video were mixed about people showing their love for her and people telling us how much they didn't care for her. Now one of the main criticisms that came up in the comments and something that we've heard the Wheel of Time community talk about before and debate over and over and over again is is Egwene Alvere a Mary Sue character? Now in today's video, we're gonna be examining the question, is Egwene Alvere actually a Mary Sue? Before diving into the video, let me quickly mention the channel sponsor, you. That's right, this video is being sponsored by my patrons over on Patreon. I've mentioned this in, on my past live stream, but I'll be transitioning possibly to being a full-time YouTuber here uh, and running the website, and I really can't make that transition without the support that I've been getting from folks like you. Make sure to stay tuned to the very end of the video. I have some very special announcements and a cool perk for all of you. Stay tuned. Let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. This video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through a memory of light. If you haven't finished the books, watch this video at your own risk. It's still gonna be here once you've finished. Just click off of it and come back to it. So before we address Egwene's status as a Mary Sue on whether she is or whether she isn't, I think it's important for us to first define exactly what a Mary Sue is. And to do that, we're not just gonna look at the definition, but actually the history of the term itself. The term Mary Sue dates back to 1973 and was first coined by writer Paula Smith, who wrote for a magazine called The Menagerie. She wrote a parody story called A Trekkie's Tale that was satirizing some of the ridiculous and unrealistic characters that would show up in Star Trek fan fiction. I'm gonna read a relatively short excerpt from this because you can see exactly what she's talking about and it's kind of funny. Gee, golly, gosh, Glorioski thought Mary Sue as she stepped onto the bridge of the Enterprise. Here I am, the youngest lieutenant in the fleet, only 15 and a half years old. Captain Kirk came up to her. Oh, Lieutenant, I love you madly. Will you come to bed with me? Captain, I am not that kind of girl. You're right, and I respect you for it. Here, take over the ship for a minute while I go get us some coffee. Mr. Spock came onto the bridge. What are you doing in the command seat, Lieutenant? The captain told me to. Flawlessly logical, I admire your mind. Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott beamed down with Lieutenant Mary Sue to Rigel 37, where they were attacked by green androids and thrown into prison. In a moment of weakness, Lieutenant Mary Sue revealed to Mr. Spock that she too was half Vulcan. Recovering quickly, she sprung the lock with her hairpin and they all got back to the ship. Back on board, Dr. McCoy and Lieutenant Mary Sue found out that the men who had beamed down were seriously stricken by jumping hole Robbies. Mary Sue less so. While the four officers languished in sickbay, Lieutenant Mary Sue ran the ship and ran it so well, she received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Vulcan Order of Gallantry, and the Tralfamadorian Order of guy Good Guyhood. However, the disease finally got to her and she fell fatally ill. In the sickbay, as she breathed her last, she was surrounded by Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott, all weeping ashamedly at the loss of her beautiful youth and youthful beauty, intelligence, capability, and all-around niceness. Even to this day, her birthday is a national holiday on the Enterprise. Now, obviously that's ridiculous, but the example here illustrates a character who seems flawless and astonishes everyone she comes in contact with, with her niceness and her competence. Characters with the Mary Sue term also upstage the main protagonist with their perfection, which you see here, her upstaging the main characters in the Star Trek cast. The term Mary Sue gradually gained the connotation of wish fulfillment for the author. The writer would write in a character that would be a proxy for themselves and represent an idealized version of themselves. In the example of that fan fiction, writing yourself as the object of everyone on the Enterprise's affection, and being universally loved and capable is an example of that. The negative connotation of a Mary Sue character is that they are typically poorly developed characters that lack realistic characteristics or a realistic arc. They can seem dull as they just win at everything they try. Additionally, a Mary Sue often upstages the main protagonist, as we said earlier. So what exactly is the definition of a Mary Sue? A Mary Sue is a character that is so competent and perfect that it seems absurd, even in the fictional setting. A Mary Sue might, in their characterization, disregard completely the natural laws of the fictional universe, or even the details of their character's past that would indicate they should have the level of competency that they do in the world. So, does all of that apply to Egwene? Well, let's take a look. Let's start by examining if Egwene is, indeed, 
perfect and supremely competent to the point that it's absurd? I think the simple answer here is no, but let's get into why. The argument for Egwene being a Mary Sue character typically stems from the assertion that she achieves too much too fast, and she's so good at things without really having a reason to be. People cite the fact that she learns to channel so quickly, the fact that she rediscovers how to travel, her miraculous abilities in the world of dreams, and her capability to lead despite only being between 18 and 20 years old during the story. To lay it out exactly, Egwene learns the world of dreams so well that within a year of learning, she defeats a forsaken in the world of dreams. She goes from being an outcast accepted that had run away from the tower to not only becoming the Omberlin Sea, but reuniting the tower, she stages a resistance within the White Tower against Elida as acting as a novice. She rediscovers how to travel and make Quindiar, something that no channeler had done since the breaking of the world. All of this adds together to make her seem too powerful too soon, right? Like it can't be realistic that a character like Egwene could actually exist. Well, not so fast. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at each of these things. We're gonna take a look at three aspects of Egwene's character that many point to to say that she's a Mary Sue. First, we'll take a look at her channeling abilities with the One Power. Second, we'll examine her abilities in the world of dreams. And third, we'll examine her leadership skills and her arc within the story. At the end, we'll decide if Egwene is a Mary Sue character and get into some detail about who she is at a core level. So let's start with her channeling ability. This is probably the least talked about ability of hers when people call Egwene a Mary Sue, but it's still worth taking a look at because it does factor into some of the other things that we're gonna talk about. Egwene is not the strongest channeler in the series, not even close actually. Others achieve higher abilities than she has. She matures faster than some of the other characters like Nynaeve and Elaine, but this is explained by her captivity with the Shancham. She was forced to channel at her peak strength, something she could not have done in the White Tower, a result of using the Eidom. Egwene is very strong in Earth, something that isn't true of many female channelers. But Egwene is equally weak at other things. She can't heal beyond, like, minor scrapes, for example. Egwene does rediscover traveling, something that seems out of place for somebody who's only 19 years old and just learned to channel like a year ago. However, she did receive some hints on how to do it from Rand. As he described how he traveled, she used a similar weave to enter the world of dreams to get to Saladar, and then Mogidian confirmed it for her even though she already kinda had a rough idea. None of that is really out of place in the universe of the Wheel of Time. Given that she has weaknesses and she isn't even remotely close to peak strength among the channelers, she sort of fails the Mary Sue test, at least in regards to her channeling abilities. Tack on the fact that Mary Sue characters often upstage the main protagonist, and Egwene in no way upstages Rand in regards to the ability to channel. I'd say from a channeling perspective, Egwene is definitely not a Mary Sue. But let's take a look at another of her powerful traits, and that is her abilities as a dreamer or a dreamwalker. We first see her power as a dreamer manifest when Varen gives her the dream Terangrial. But later she goes to the Aiel Waste and learns from the Aiel Wise Ones for months. So what was Egwene able to accomplish in the world of dreams that makes her a Mary Sue? Well, for one, the speed in which she learned is somewhat remarkable. How could Egwene move from being a complete noob when it comes to dreamwalking to becoming potentially the greatest dreamer in the world a year later. She literally not only masters the world of dreams, but faces down a Forsaken who was hundreds of years older than her with training from the Age of Legends and defeats her. That in itself should prove that she's a Mary Sue to most people. So let's take a look at this a little bit further. First of all, we see that Egwene is the first dreamer in the White Tower in hundreds of years. And the I.O. Wise Ones confirm that she's exceptionally strong in Teleron Riyadh naturally. She's not only a dream walker, but she can also see visions of the future, and she has innate control over objects and people within the world of dreams. For one, you could argue that her simply having all of those abilities sets her apart from most of the people in the series, and that in itself kind of makes her Mary Sueish, right? Well, to agree, that's a valid point. The counter is, is that she isn't the only person like that in the story. There are Aiel Wise Ones that are dreamers, there are Forsaken that are dreamers, Perrin is a dreamer, albeit a different kind. She isn't the only person who fits the role of a dreamer or has these capabilities, and she isn't even the strongest, technically. Perrin deflects Balefire with his mind, something that Egwene did not even realize was possible. But what about Egwene's defeat of the Forsaken, someone with hundreds of years of training? Well, that is an impressive feat, and actually something that Egwene almost didn't pull off. Masana essentially has Egwene defeated before their little battle of wills. This is an event that many people point to as sort of dumb and not believable because Egwene basically says, Egwene Alvir is 20 years old, but the Amarlin Siege is ancient, or something like that. And that because the Amarlin is ancient, that she can break Masana's mind. That's basically the line of thinking. Well, here's the deal about that, though. For one, Egwene doesn't defeat Masana by being stronger in the power, or even being a more powerful dreamer, necessarily. 
She beats her because she has a stronger force of will. Whether Egwene's statement about the Amarlin being ancient or older than a Forsaken is dumb or not, what matters is that Egwene believes it, and that her strength of will, something that's always been a part of her character from the very beginning, is stronger than Masana, and that's why she wins. One of everyone's major criticisms of Egwene is that she's arrogant and full of herself at times, but in this case, it makes total sense, and that arrogance is what helps her defeat a Forsaken, if that's what you want to call it. So what about her learning too fast? The question that I really never thought we got an answer to is how long does it actually take to learn the basics of the dream? We're never really given a statement that it says it takes centuries to master it or anything like that. Of course people are going to get better with age, but keep in mind Egwene isn't perfect and she does make a ton of mistakes. She's captured by Masana, despite eventually defeating her. I think with direct tutelage and Egwene's innate drive to learn everything that there is to know, it's believable that she attained the level of skill that she did. I'm not really convinced that defeating Masana makes her all-powerful in the World of Dreams anyway, and I would argue that Perrin, Moradin, Mulgideon, and Lanfear were all stronger than Gwyn in the dream. See my most powerful Dreamwalker video for more on the topic. I'll have that linked in the description if you want to watch that. So lastly, we come to Egwene's arc, specifically her rise to the Amarlin seat and subsequent consolidation of power through some very astute political maneuvering and planning. The argument here is that, for one, why would anyone raise a 20-year-old who isn't even an Aes Sedai yet to the Amarlin seat, even though she's considered a runaway simply because she knows the Dragon Reborn? Secondly, how could the same girl consolidate political power among the most politically astute and intelligent women in the world, who many of which are literally a century older than her, when she has no experience other than being an innkeeper's daughter, a captive, a student for a little bit, and finally a pupil to a very straightforward talking women in the I.O. Waste. They don't play political games. So where was her preparation to become a master political tactician? This is actually an area where I don't find there to be a real solid response that explains it all believably, but let's do our best to try. First, Egwena being raised to Amarlin is explained in the story as the rebel Aes Sedai needing a figurehead that wasn't in the tower at the time of Swan's deposing, they wanted someone close to Rand, as they knew the Dragon Reborn would be a major issue that they'd be facing and they'd need to approach. They wanted someone young and powerful, and more importantly, they wanted someone they could control. The only reason that one of the two most politically powerful Aes Sedai in the camp weren't chosen in Ramonda and Lelaine was that their two political factions couldn't abide the other one gaining the Amelin seat. So Egwene was chosen. Now, given the criteria, that kind of makes sense. But then again, those criteria almost seem designed for Egwene to fit them perfectly, right? But forgetting that for a moment, Egwene does appear to be someone who would be easily controlled. And when she arrives in Saladar, she kind of is. She's in above her head. She's rightfully startled as she thought she was getting arrested and they're raising her to the highest position of authority they have. However, this is the beginning of Egwene's seemingly supernatural political ability. Now, to a degree, I think some of this can be explained. Swan Sanche was someone who was a master of political intrigues, and she had been kind of a shifty Amarlin seat herself. Swan very much helps Egwene, and she advises her. Without Swan... There's really no way Egwene pulls off anything she does in terms of consolidating the Aes Sedai. This also explains away Egwene's later political abilities when Swan isn't around, like when she's in the White Tower. She's incredibly observant. She's very driven. Uh, in my mind, I always kind of pictured Egwene sort of like Michael Jordan. I know that sounds ridiculous, but let me explain. For any of you who saw the Michael Jordan documentary that aired on ESPN during the pandemic, you would see kind of like the innate drive that he has to be the best at things. Like, it isn't normal. Most people are not like that. Most people will never be like that. Most people don't have the mental toughness or tenacity to, to pull that off. Egwene has that. She's very intelligent and capable, but she outthinks and outworks most people. So, that brings us to Egwene overall. Is she perfect? No. She makes plenty of mistakes. She isn't likable to most people, which is actually a sign she isn't a Mary Sue. Mary Sue characters tend to be liked by all of the characters in the story. Uh, Egwene certainly is not. Is she competent? Yes. Is she so perfect that it's absurd or so competent that it's absurd? No, not really, not even close. Is it going to marry Sue? No. But I do think she has the traits that put her into a subsection of the Mary Sue trope. Egwene shows some qualities of what is called a Black Hole Sue character. Now, what the heck is a Black Hole Sue? A Black Hole Sue is a character that causes other characters to do things they wouldn't normally or believably do, to enable the plot for the Black Hole Sioux. The whole Black Hole thing is about rotating around them. So for instance, characters that are Black Hole Sioux may face a problem or mistake, 
but they are able to overcome it because the other characters around them act out of character to benefit their place in the plot. So where does Egwene show signs of this? I think of a lot of it centers around her political maneuverings. The Aes Sedai that are formerly so intelligent, such good schemers, super experienced with intrigue, begin to act like bumbling idiots around her. There's no strategy behind Ramonda and Lelaine's opposition to Egwene, and it makes you wonder how they gained the influence they had being so transparently selfish and dumb when it comes to how they try to act. They fall right into political trap after trap that Egwene and Swan set for them. So this is less about Egwene herself being perfect and more about how the other characters just kind of turn stupid so she can gain power. You can see this again in the White Tower during her captivity. It seems unlikely that the captured rebel leader would be allowed to freely roam the White Tower and start an uprising, even if Elida is shown to be dumb towards the end of her reign. Does Egwene fit the Black Hole Sioux trope completely? No. She does earn respect in the White Tower. She's treated badly. She's talked down to. She earns respect based on her knowledge, wisdom, and her ability to lead by example. Things that she learned from her experiences with the Wise Ones and Swan and her learning from other characters and even Moraine. So in closing, I don't really think Egwene is a Mary Sue. I can certainly see why people think that she is. I think it's a valid topic for debate, but at the end of the day, she's just a very competent, very driven, and very powerful character who is really the secondary main protagonist of the story. Things do seem to happen for her benefit at times, and that certainly leads to the appearance of a Mary Sue status, but at the end of the day, I don't think she is a Mary Sue character. Now, before ending the video, I think I would re be remiss not to mention the three main characters of Rand, Perrin, and Matt. I'm not going to get too much into it in this video. It might be a topic for another video. There's probably a better argument for them to be the Gary Stu type characters than there is for Egwene to be a Mary Sue. The only difference is the in-world explanation of being Taviran, something that many speculated that Egwene herself might be before Robert Jordan shot it down. So, what do you all think? Is Egwene a Mary Sue? Make sure to let me know what you think and why in the comments below. Now, at the beginning of the video, I promised you guys a couple announcements, so here they are. First off, as I mentioned in the live stream on Tuesday, one part of the new website is actually active, and that is the Wheel of Time store that we built for the website. You will notice that my old merch is gone from below. There's no more stuff there. And so we've completely replaced all of that with new merch. Um, in fact, we've got new stuff like books, art, maps, all kinds of stuff based around the Wheel of Time. Obviously, you can find cheaper stuff on Amazon, but every dime that you spend in the store helps support thegreatblight.com, which will be going live in its beta form here within a week. Just head to www.shopwheeloftime.com or click the link in the description below and check out all the stuff up for sale. We'll be adding more as we go, including some more old whiteboard stuff, uh, which I know has been requested quite a bit. The second big announcement has to do with Patreon. I recently rebranded the entire Patreon around the upcoming website and changed all the tiers and the rewards for the various tiers. Additionally, for the next two weeks, I am running a big promotion. As I said, Patreon is the best way to support the website. And so the promotion that I'm running is all of the people that are currently patrons at the Dreadlord tier or higher, so that's the $25 tier and higher, or the people that sign up for that tier within the next two weeks are going to receive 10% off at shopwheeloftime.com in addition to the normal rewards at that tier. All you have to do is click the link in the description below, check it out, sign up. It really, really helps, guys. Thank you so much to everybody who already contributes. If you are at one of the lower tiers and you want to upgrade, uh, I would more than appreciate it if you wanted to do that. Thank you so much. It's what keeps everything running and keeps the lights on. So thanks so much. So thanks for watching, guys. If you liked the video, make sure to smash the like button and absolutely subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. Even after the big influx of subscribers that we've had recently, close to 60% of my views are by people that are not subscribed to the channel. If you are one of those 60%, just hit the subscribe button. It helps us out. Thanks again, guys. And until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?